So, so ladies and gentlemen, it's 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 great uh, to to you know have another advocate session, uh, and uh, I believe you must have seen the book for the course of last week, uh, where we have an extremely interesting uh, you know group of panelists to talk about uh, the impact of the current economic crisis on on small and medium enterprises. Uh, let just just to introduce this interview of uh, speakers and also set the context. Uh, so we have with us uh, Mr. Harpo, uh, we have Apinas, and we have, uh, uh, Mr. Harpo uh, is, is, is the founder of Harpo Restaurants. Mr. Apinas is uh, the, he heads ISO, uh, and Rihanna is an economist and an associate at the Regard Institute. Uh, so good evening, everyone, uh, and uh, it's wonderful to see all of you. Just to you know, set the context, and Rehana, please do jump in. It, jump in. Uh, I think you know we are, we, are, we are facing a severe economic crisis, I, and we, we see it on our roads, on 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 day to day activities. The kind of impact it has had. Uh, so so shall we you know start this conversation by asking our, our, our entrepreneurs here uh, just how their experience has been over the course of the last few weeks. Uh, with the current economic crisis, uh, Mr. Harper, sir, would you like to go uh, go first? And yeah, okay. yeah. I hope everybody can hear me loud and clear. Yeah. Yes. So you, if you the last two weeks or last month, I think we should track. So are ninety people. Uh, there's some disturbance. I think so, they... Are we... Uh, uh, no, it's breaking up. Sort of Sorry, just to bear with us for a few minutes. We're trying. Can you hear us? Hello. Hey, y'all. Yes. Can you hear okay. me? Can you, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, we can hear you now. Right. Yeah, fine. Uh, yeah. So, so your question was, uh, what, uh, what was the last two weeks like, right? Or the last one yeah. month was. And uh, your experience. It would be. Ask me how the last three years. You know, but people. A lot of people get that. Uh, you know, the hospitality industry has gone through. Let me re re rephrase it. The hospitality industry has gone through a thirty-year-old war. They've gone through a tsunami. We have gone through a Easter. We have gone through a COVID, and we have gone through an economic. We are currently in economic now. The hospital has just suffered, right? Uh, but the last two weeks or the last three years have been really bad. After Easter Sunday, yes, 
we took a big dip to hospitality industry. Uh, the SMEs took a big dip, the restauranteers and uh, all of us. But it picked up slightly at the end of that year, 19 November, December, January was good. Uh, but then COVID, uh, March 17th, if I'm not 18. And it has been, uh, it's been a tough, it's been a tough ride, you know. Uh, but that COVID, you know, people locked in a house. You couldn't go out. You could have ordered food, you know. Uh, you know, uh, how, how, how do you handle this? This is, this is, because you don't have, you don't have diesel to pump your generators. You don't have fuel to get to work every day. Uh, challenge, uh, you know. Also, your experience, uh, how, how these current, how the changing economic environment has impacted you uh, with, with business operations? Uh, how have you been uh, facing these challenges? Hi, can you guys hear me? I'm sorry, because you were breaking up. Um, can you hear me? You're good? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Great. So, I mean, for us, uh, the first thing was we saw staff morale go down. You know, and uh, everyone has something going on in, like, you know, at the back of their mind. Um, so, keeping these guys motivated, the cost of raw materials and the availability of these raw materials in the market uh, have fluctuated. Um, trying to source. Uh, forecasting how much we need for the month or two months or three months and trying to find that. Uh, so we've all been on our toes. I mean, if there's a power cut, we can't serve customers. Um, and I, I mean, like Harpo said, we've been through a lot in the last three years. So, uh, yeah, it's been pretty hectic. Uh, just, uh, you know, give us a bit of a you know, outline of the macroeconomic environment and all just relate to these stories that we're hearing. Sure. Uh, Vimana, your voice keeps breaking up. Not sure, maybe it's from your side. Maybe right. the connection. Yeah. Um, sorry? No, we'll try to rectify it, but you can go on. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think obviously this situation that we are facing right now has been uh, you know, boiling up. Now it has come sort of to a, a really bad uh, situation where, you know, we don't have fuel, we are having power cuts, you know, there's a, uh, you know, an IMF program, but even, um, you know, till that happened, we knew that we are going to be depleting our foreign exchange reserves and we are going to be in a situation where we are not going to be able to afford to pay for the things we need, like the fuel and the gas and all, you know, medicines, all of this. So, um, you know, I completely appreciate the fact that the hospitality industry has actually ha been having, you know, it, the, the situation has been prolonged for them because we came off of uh, you know 2019 the easter attacks and then came into covid and you know it's been three bad years and um, you know we were hopeful of a recovery so i think in november when we started getting tourists we were we you know the country and uh, particularly um, tourism industries and tourism industry and the hospitality industry there was a lot of uh, you know hope that we will be able to sort of bounce back but now what we are seeing is that uh, COVID is kind of behind us. It's no longer sort of, you know, affecting us. You know, sit exam, school children can't, you know, don't have paper to sit examination. So now I think um, you know, now it has, it's even worse than I think COVID.
times i would say because now at least you know with covid we could say okay there there will be an end eventually but with the economic situation right now i can imagine why moral is so low because everyone is so worried what is going to happen to sri lanka where is it going to end up yeah thank you for the uh, for the, uh, the the explanation on uh, the, ma- uh, the, ma- the macro picture uh, just, just going back to uh, both our uh, and it keeps face by uh fall in media prices and how how they're trying to be resilient uh, uh would you uh, best tell us you know what's what, what how are you meeting these challenges you know that there are shortages there is shortages in gas uh there are power cuts uh, uh lack of fuel uh and and i will come to the to to, to this other topic of import restrictions in a while uh, but but how are you how are you being resilient how are you meeting these uh meeting challenges uh on on a daily basis sorry hapo we can't hear you there there's a disturbance now uh Can it's breaking up but it's better yes yeah, yeah. it's better now is it better yes very quick ask again because there was a serious disturbance right uh, you know? i i uh, i was i was asking now i think i think we we've, we've all looked we we all experiencing those shortages just wanted to know what entrepreneurs how are you being raised how are you meeting these challenges uh that was my question how are- you asking me yes how yes. how you're managing the shortages yeah so so like for years you know we wait for the gas when and we we all clap as they they have come you know wow that's nice to have gas you know? <laughs> but you know i i took to twitter and i about a month or a half ago and i told uh, you know there's no gas and the, i had i didn't a number with call me to see for the lead progress chairman is it you know you must be careful what you say you know you guys i said yeah i mean i'm not talking for half i said i'm talking for the industry here you know it's not that me not having the industry which is suffering right so you know even uh, we sent them front in asking me hey, how do you how can you help out because me being the president Energy at today. Every day is a new day. You know, and you know, office fighting with staff who can't come to work. Petrol queues, trying to get gas vehicles. You know, so 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 every day is a but uh, obviously. but that that's what that's through the day um i mean for us uh we've been uh speaking to guys in the wholesale market trying to understand um what their sentiments are you know when will we run out of vegetable oil when will we run out of flour when we will run out of different types of products and we try and stock up we've increased our power levels uh we try and we're focusing a lot on our wastage i'm giving incentives to my staff to cut down on wasting um we're looking at controlling costs very seriously during this time and not um unnecessarily wasting our products and um just trying to keep your ears close to what's happening in the market you know with all the raw materials that's what we're trying to do I mean I even had to buy gas in the black market I mean we used to pay <laughs> about 9000 bucks for a cylinder I paid 30000 uh and whatever it takes to keep this going you know and uh, that's I mean that's basically it. I mean like Harpo said every day is a new day you know whatever it takes we just um on our toes every day yeah uh 
I think uh, if you were to look at it from a market perspective, uh, can you let us know as to what what has gone wrong? Here? Uh, and from a from a very perspective, uh, would you be able to explain as to why they are really experiencing these uh, these shortages? Sure. Um, so I think uh, let's let's talk about gas because um, both Harpo and Akinash were talking about the gas situation. So um, you know, as we know, uh, Sri Lankan the Sri Lankan government has always had sort of price control on uh, gas cylinders. So there's always been um, a ceiling on the price uh, that the distributors can charge. Um, and as we know, there are you know only two two distributors in the country. There's the um, Litro, which is um, the, the state-owned enterprise, and then we have LAPS, which is the only other um, private operator in the industry. Um, so what has happened is that now, if we go back to uh, say last year around November, we we started hearing about these gas cylinders exploding. Um, so I think the report, which was finally published on that, what it said was that because of the price. Uh, Ceiling. The uh, distributors had attempted to change the composition of the um, the gas cylinder to make it more cost effective, and obviously so that they are not absorbing a loss. Um, and then, uh, you know, because they couldn't continue to supply the same, uh, you know, the gas same type of cylinder with the same type of composition, they had. Compromised on the, you know, uh, the composition, the gas composition uh, in the cylinder, uh, and then we we saw we heard of all these explosions, which was a very bad situation. And I think that, um, you know, once again, then the operators realized that they couldn't continue with that. But then they they then they realized that they actually can't supply uh, gas cylinders at that price. So then what happened was there was a shortage in the market. Um, and obviously, when there are shortages, that creates black markets. Uh, Apinash just said that at one point he paid thirty thousand for a gas cylinder. I mean, just imagine that, right? That's like overnight. That's a six, like what six times uh, the normal price that you would pay. Um, I mean, that's it's just absurd. It changes your, you know, it changes the cost structure so drastically. And then, you know, it has it has to, you know. Restaurants then have to wonder: Is it even practical for me to keep operating at this point? Um, and I, uh, I think there are particularly in down south, uh, which is having a big issue. Uh, a lot of the restaurants are having big issues with, uh, you know, sourcing gases. There was um, one restaurant owner who said uh, that he he finds it very difficult to get gas, and sometimes there are you know other people who get it from the neighboring towns, but by that time it costs about ten thousand uh, rupees a cylinder. Um, and then I also heard about uh, like distributors who are refusing to sell to homes uh, because they are keeping it so that you know they can sell it to hotels who are you know who are who are able to afford it at a higher rate. So. Um, you know now what's going to happen is that the people who will somehow pay even those exorbitant fees will probably be able to get their hands on some you know some of the uh, items which are in shortage but that leaves like a huge portion of the people particularly now i'm i'm talking uh, about say very small businesses and uh, you know poorer households they are going to be left you know in the lurch there yeah. It's it's uh, you know they're not going to be able to afford it at all, and then um, you know when we talk about people standing in queues, we must also consider the opportunity cost of you know your time wasted. You are spending six seven hours just standing in a queue, whereas you could be out working and earning. So I think we need to consider um, that cost as well when we are considering how much more expensive is it now than what it was before. Uh, Apinash, uh, Harpo, would you want to also, re you know, re respond to Rehana or add 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 on add anything to the kind of insight she's given? Uh, can you hear me? Uh, can you, can you guys hear me? I can yeah, hear you. All right. Okay. 
uh, okay, I think I think let's let's also jump, uh, you know, shift gear, gears a bit. Uh, something that I wanted to, uh, you know, touch on is uh, with with import restrictions. Uh, I, I believe uh, we we've, we've seen a new uh, line of import restrictions that were that were that were imposed over the course of last week. Uh, like, what is the kind of impact it has had on your business? Uh, has it, you know, reduced? your accessibility to uh, vital ingredients. Uh, just let us know, uh, you know, what, what the experience has been uh, on, on the ground, uh, especially with these import restrictions. I think I went off. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can, we can. Yeah, so, uh, you, were, you were talking, sorry, I, I got disturbed with the OSIS call. Um, so you were talking about getting ingredients from overseas. That's what they say, like imported yes. stuff. Yes. 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 And yeah, so, yeah. So that's a huge problem because we work a lot uh, with imported stuff like and uh, stuff. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> so we are. Uh, Harpo, your audio is breaking up. Yeah, I know that's Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, at the moment, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so the issue is when running a restaurant, like, a, like an Italian restaurant, for example, you know, we depend a lot on, you know, uh, on stuff which we import, like the salmon, the, the steaks, the lamb racks, the lamb shanks which we can't get anymore, you know. So what they're doing is, luckily for me, I have my own production kitchen where we produce our own pasta and we supply supermarkets and stuff. So I'm kind of, you know, balancing the act there. But, uh, so, but also what, what important is customers also understand the fact that the industry is going through a very tough period, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, when it comes to the wine as well, you know, they're coming every day. You know, you have an email from a, from a supplier saying we have taken the price up by, by a thousand rupees, you know. So it's very difficult to actually do menu costing, you know, your beverage cost is high, your food cost is high. Uh, like Abhina said, you know, uh, we, are, we are obviously zooming in on control. How do we control this whole thing now, you know, where we should be put our energy into uh, creating stuff, doing more creative marketing and stuff like that. But then you're bogged down into this, you know. Uh, but uh, but saying that we 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 have restrictions on certain restaurants of ours, you know, for the time being, we have we said, especially going into an April, May, also which are not good months for trading, if you know what I mean, you know. So we're keeping it down a little bit. Uh, but uh, in fact, I had a press conference yesterday. And I, I appealed to the government, uh, especially the hospitality industry, where they where if they can give us a concession on imported items. Because you see, the hospitality industry brings in the dollars, you know. We are one of the foremost people who bring the dollars. So because uh, we can't outpress ourselves, especially if you are to compete with the uh, Bali, the Singapore, the Malaysia, you know. We need to keep it also price sensitive. People are price sensitive also. It's very important to understand that, you know. Uh, you might not have customers in your restaurants one day because, you know, of the price escalation, you know. So, uh, so we, we try to keep it simple and try to keep, try to, as I said, Minimize uh, wastage, which I mean, I said, and we are betting on day by day. Apinash, would you like to uh, jump yeah, in sure. on the phone? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so for us, obviously, the import restriction, restrictions has uh, driven the cost of raw materials up. So we're constantly, uh, so in terms of operations, we spend time actually costing this each time and seeing it pay. Am I making the right margin and is this worth keeping on the menu? And then we make it an unavailable item. And then, uh, I mean, right now we're seeing how we can use local ingredients and come up with more, I mean, new dishes, uh, which are more localized. I mean, we are finding our way around it, but uh, it's a constant problem, you know. And uh, for example, we used to use a Japanese mayonnaise, you know, and now I'm using a different brand and that completely changes the taste. 
and uh, then the question is hey do you want to serve this and uh, get a complaint or do you want to take it off the menu um, and things like that so um, the import restrictions are affecting our operations a lot um, Kapu, I hope you can get us all uh, hopefully lobby and get restaurants and hotels permits to maybe get these ingredients down just for us not to sell in the market but uh, at least to produce good quality food and um, keep serving our customers good food you know yeah okay. also we need to that very serious try to talk to it how they can area you know for us yeah. we what we do, most people don't and the authorities don't they're going to have a huge problem comes to hr for finding people in the industry you know quite a big going forward uh i mean i'm going to uh apo would you would you be able to repeat what you said uh I think, I think you should lean into the audio because there is yeah. a break. Yeah. I think much, much yes. better. Yeah. So, so, so what I'm trying to say also is that the hospitality industry is facing a huge HR issue. In the, you know, it's, I mean, Ash also will agree with me. It's very difficult to find staff. It's not only the restaurants, it's the hotels as well. Lots of people are leaving to the Middle East, to the Maldives. So you have yeah. to have a problem at some point of time. You know you're finished fighting the economic war, and you're going to fight a HR problem now, which is already happening as we talk. People are investing in putting up boutique hotels, big five-star hotels. I mean, hotel owners have spoken to me personally and said, "Harpo, you know you have hotels. Can you help us?" I said, "I close my hotels, pull down COVID because schools are not allowed to operate." Well, yeah i yeah i think uh, i think hospitality and tourism has had a labor issue even before covid right so i can just imagine the situation now because people are migrating and you know three bad years they are moving into other industries so it's it's going to get worse and especially because you know if you are going to rely on tourism then we need to have a steady um, supply of labor to the industry yeah so i think Government also is trying to introduce more schools into all regions of the country. I ha- I have been lobbying over the years to try to bring this into the main curriculum of the schools as a subject, mm-hmm. which is important. You know, or else we will have to go to, uh, like the Maldives and like the Middle East, get people from Bangladesh, the Philippines, India, which anyway the construction industry is doing now. You know, they are bringing in Indian workers, and uh, so I hope at some point in time they will understand the fact that this has to happen. Other your tough ta- charging premium rates for hotels for your food, but you can't get proper service. Mm-hmm. You know you can't. The young people they are going to the Middle East they're earning big money. The games are starting in 2025. Qatar is opening up. Everyone's moving there now. You know the opportunities are massive, and we cannot much match their salaries. You know, uh, so you need to you know, look at that is a huge problem. I foresee. uh this is uh i didn't add your insights on on what we were discussing before on on the kind of import restrictions and the kind of impact it can have at the uh, at the at the macro level especially with msme uh i was told that you know i mean at least in the work that we do at the vagada institute it it definitely you know the the argument of the government has been uh that it, you know that we're importing a lot of apples and oranges uh but but if you if you go to peta and which banana you know the best example that he uses is the fact that the people who sell uh, apples and oranges are are common uh entrepreneurs and 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 you know this is their way of making a daily uh daily wage and meeting uh you know the cost of live uh, meeting living costs so rehana what what do you, what at the macro level you know what kind of impact will this have uh, just will you be able to elaborate on this 
Sure, yeah. I, I, I actually don't know where we have this mentality where we think apples and cheese and oranges are some kind of luxury, you know, something that comes from heaven where we shouldn't be consuming it unless, unless we are, you know, living very exuberantly. Um, you know, I was recently talking to, uh, I took an Uber that day to Colombo and I was talking to um, the driver and he was telling me about how his child likes to eat cheese, but it's very difficult for him to afford it. And now he can't even find it, right? I mean, <laughs> I, I don't think there's anywhere else in the world that considers cheese to be uh, some kind of, you know, exotic food or luxury food. I mean, it's, it's normal. It's, it's just, it's consumer choice. People, you know, people like to eat cheese. They should be able to eat cheese. It's, you know, why do, why are we living in, you know, in, in the 21st century with the government that's telling us that you shouldn't be eating cheese? It's, it's just absurd. And, uh, you know, cheese is just one example, but we are also, you know, if we talk about the basics, there's also, you know, shortages. There's going to be, if, if we don't, you know, figure out what we are going to be doing, there's going to be shortages in a lot of the essentials like rice and dal. So, I mean, that's just your basics. And if, you know, um, I think at this point we have to consider, uh, the government has to start considering that, you know, we are going to need a lot more help um, to meet our food security needs. Um, you know, people are otherwise going to be, you know, starving and there's going to be a lot of malnutrition and malnutrition leads to, um, you know, a lot of health issues. Like this is not, nobody wants this. So, you know, why we, we should be focusing on the cheese. We should be focusing on, you know, do we have, are we able to meet our essential, uh, you know, food needs? And in my honest opinion, I don't think we are in a position to do that. So that is really the most worrying. Uh, I think on to that, uh, I think something that probably puzzles uh, me personally is this whole issue of, you know, some, uh, a group of people defining what, 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 what good is essential. Uh, just would you guys be able to add, you know, add on to as to how uh, the kind of impact this kind of intervention has had, uh, probably in your business activities? Because and Rehama, you might would you would you be able to say that you no, know, what what from an economic sense is it justifiable to call a good uh, essential? Uh, and and you know how has it impacted the hospitality uh, industry in your you know in your experiences? Should I, I go mean, one example? I can think, yeah, oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, go. go ahead. No, it's okay. Afina. You go ahead. So one example that comes to my mind is uh, a few weeks ago, there was uh, a shortage of uh, vegetable oil, palm oil, because uh, uh, there's a ban on fatty oils. And uh, when you go into the market, they say, hey, this is refined coconut oil. Try this. All right. You take this back, your whole restaurant stinks of coconut oil. This burns fast. Your costs go up, and uh, this wouldn't work out. I mean, on a commercial, you can't cook. Like, I mean, like pasta and all this stuff with coconut oil, you know. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so then what do you do? You know. So, uh, I mean, that's. I mean, I, I, just an example I thought of. You know, while uh, you guys were saying, but yeah, please go on. Sorry. You're talking. We run pizza, <laughs> right? You know, and of the supplies, sorry, sir, we don't have a shipment coming for the next one month. Then you go to a local and, you know, you say, what is the quality of brand? You have to protect your brand. But you don't understand, we have worked so hard over the years to bring the brand up, you know. And when you do inferiority, inferiority kind of cheese, what do you do? So, you know, <laughs> cheese is not a luxury. Right, but you said earlier, you know, it's a basic thing, you know. So we are fighting that a lot, you know. Yeah, and uh, you know, Vimangi, your question about you know what, who defines what is essential and what is a luxury, and why do we do this? I, you know, I completely disagree with defining you know one thing as an essential and another thing as a luxury, because end of the day, everything that you know, we are consuming is tied to, you know, somebody's livelihood, it's tied to the supply chain. 
uh, you know just because we are living comfortably you know living comfortably and enjoying life is is not a crime right that's something we should all aspire to so i i you know i i definitely agree with you when you say that you know who defines what is essential what is luxury and why why are we doing this um you know at i remember reading this story about you know how like in the 70s uh, apples and things were you know they were also not you know it was not allowed to consume those but uh, you know the ruling elites used to consume apples at that time it's not like they didn't so you know uh, is you know the people who put these rules in place for us to follow are they following it that's you know that's one question that we should be asking um and we, you know i i once again i i never i would never agree with you know uh, you know trying to restrict consumer choice and trying to restrict people's lifestyles so i agree with you on on that uh uh this also a random uh message to the audience uh if you have any questions uh just put it across in the chat and i'll try to take it up uh but we've been speaking for about i would say about uh 35 close to 40 minutes uh so so if you have any questions please uh put it up in the chat uh uh and and i think uh, not something that you know comes up to my mind is also i think there are a lot of questions also on the demand side uh just wanted to know uh, harpo uh, and uh, everyone else uh have you you know have you seen a fall in dem- consumer demand uh with with the with the current uh, economic crisis what has the, what has the perception been on the demand side of things yeah i was at a certain location last friday i looked around and i i was with this person said, there is no economic crisis in sri lanka and people were like wow this is a great you know what i mean so it's that little select which we which is actually not the correct picture you know but when i looked around and people are queuing up in for gas and for petrol and, and i was like hey there's nothing wrong here this country is perfect from our outside point you know this guy from over he said hey, i don't see any problem here so there's demand so i mean i'm just there's there is that segment of people who go out and enjoy themselves the restaurants are full at times you have to make a reservation the hotels are full it's so, so there is that there is a different uh, perception as, as well you know so there is demand and people are not really complain about pricing anymore if you look at it people say yes we understand that these things are so one of the commons some guy can't spoke i said how come you are increased your prices i said wow <laughs> is to hear you know there, there are people asking us those questions So uh, we are a little, you know, <laughs> and I'm sure we're a little country which can bounce back. That's the advantage I think we have. You know, we are very resilient, lot of people. You know, so but we cannot think of the people who are floating around in Kalam. There's a bigger picture here. You know, that's what we should be looking at. You know, it's that poor day-to-day earner. You know, uh, who who earns off the tourism industry. And I know when I used to run the Dutch Hotel, we have a restaurant there. and you see this trash of guys waiting for someone to come and get in their trash because they can go buy a meal for some for their children you know so that's so bad it is as well you know you have people who come and say you know today one of my staff said you know sir you know i it's difficult to go home now because you know some of the buses are not running in my areas so it's sad you know so go up in price from the telecoms uh, every it's a big vicious cycle you see so i see a lot of other things going up as well it's not only food and the wines and all that but i think the overall they're talking of electricity hike <laughs> that doesn't you know and we run restaurants and we have have a acs function halls so you know that's going to impact and where do you pass it on to who do you pass it on to you know there's a limit you know that's uh abhinash would you do you do you share the same sentiment or has your experience been different yeah um uh, 
Yeah, I mean, for us, uh, again, the demand hasn't dropped as much as we expected, right? But um, I also think that's because we haven't ab absorbed the inflation like yet, you know, the, the, the costs are going to continue to rise. We need to understand when to revive. At one point, this is going to become too expensive, uh, you know, and that's how I feel. Um, and um, I think, uh, even, I mean, already on like delivery platforms, our prices are already inflated, you know. So with the new costs coming in and we push those prices up, I mean, demand will drop at some point, you know. And uh, I think we just need to prepare for that. Uh, you'll be able to give us a better... Uh, of yeah, so... But there isn't uh, all in demand. Why is it? So in terms of uh, in terms of demand, I think uh, as Apinash said, we haven't fully uh, you know absorbed the impact of inflation. But then there are also you should also consider the fact that, um, for example, the interest rates uh, offered by banks are pretty low. So people are obviously going to be you know more interested less interested in saving and they're going to be sort of on a spending spree because you know what's the point of saving because you know the, the interest rate doesn't you know help you recover your you know the cost of saving so um, that's that could be one factor that's driving a demand particularly on the sort of the higher end of the income spectrum um, and then there's also like if we take the exchange rate um, you know, the earlier there, there was a black market rate before it was floated. So there was a section of people who were getting, uh, you know, uh, remittances were still coming in. It just wasn't coming in through the bank, right? It was coming in through the Havala system and the Undia system. So people were getting suddenly, uh, you know, somebody who was getting 200 is now getting 250, 260 rupees to their hand. So, you know, that increases for that time being, they have more money to spend. So they go out and they spend. And I think um, there was, we also saw that impact in supermarkets, like supermarkets did not uh, really face a, a reduction in demand. But I think as, as we continue to go on, people's, um, you know, disposable incomes are going to be affected as we keep going. And then what's going to happen is, there's going to be a, a section of people on the higher, um, you know, end of the income spectrum who are, you know, probably earning in dollars and, some, you know, they're working in IT companies. They can, suddenly their salaries are pegged to the dollar. So obviously there are income increases. And then there's going to be, um, you know, on the low end of the spectrum, people who, you know, the value of their rupee is dropping so drastically. And what's going to happen is it's going to increase the divide between the people who have money and the people who don't have money. So that's going to increase the inequality, income inequality in Sri Lanka. And that's, you know, that's, that's, that's going to be, it's particularly worrying if you look at it from, you know, a, you know, rights-based perspective. Is this what we should be going for? And, you know, is this kind of country we want to be living in? So I think Apinash and uh, Harpo's restaurants are probably catering to people who are on the higher end of the income spectrum. So the demand is still there. Um, but if you probably go and talk to, you know, somebody who is, uh, you know, catering specifically to, you know, those on the lower end of the spectrum, like a small boutique, uh, like a small kade or something, they will probably tell you a very different story. Thank you, Rehana. I think uh, Apina uh, dropped, uh, dropped off the call, but we'll, we'll try to reconnect. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think another, I think this is also a question now that that keeps coming up is, uh, 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 is with tour regarding tourism. Uh, just wanted to know, Harpo, what do you think? Do you think uh, the kind of tourism can lead the way towards a recovery? Uh, or are we missing uh, a certain fundamentals? At least what's the business perception? Uh, can tourism uh, be our salvation? I don't think tourism alone can be a salvation. You see, I think the exporters, exporters also have to chip in. But uh, I think tourism in 2018, if I'm not mistaken, we, we, we were you know, brought in about $5.4 million, if I'm not mistaken. But um, 
uh, we need to obviously you know go out and market ourselves more Exporters as well, you know, all of all together. That tourist at a oh, I there's uh, Apo, you're breaking a game. can see you but can't hear you can you hear me now yes yeah yes we play uh something uh other thing question about tourism uh do you do you think we are missing certain rentals uh, i'm sorry i couldn't hear you could you repeat that again you said this was about tourism and yes yes uh, yes i'm not i think something that we were discussing while you when you dropped out was uh sorry. whether tourism is going to be the salvation uh because that is what is being you know broadly portrayed uh so just wanted to get your sense uh what do you think can tourism lead the way for a recovery uh, or are we missing certain economic fundamentals uh if we are if we are going to look towards recovery um so during the last few months we obviously obviously saw a surge in tourists coming in and these were from markets like russia and ukraine and uh, again i don't think we'll see that season again you know uh, it- be new markets um so it's still a lot of uncertainty over here it's very hard to say uh on this yeah i'll just uh, i'll just add something um you know i i think we have always followed this strategy of putting all our eggs in one basket so now we are relying so much on tourism we are like no tourism is going to be our salvation and of course tourism is going to contribute but there is um, as you say we need to fix our fundamentals um you know it's it's we can't uh, the, sri lanka has never sri lanka tourism has never had a problem attracting tourists right because you know we have we have it all we have the beaches we have the mountains we have you know everything and we we we've been on uh, you know condenas uh, you know top choice uh, lists and if people want to travel to sri lanka but when they see news of you know power cuts and gas you know gas poly of course gas queues uh, for the foreign uh, clients um, and when they hear of you know uncertainties and instability they're not going to want to come so it's it's almost like you know with uh, with the with what with what's happening it's almost like negative marketing is what we are doing with our current situation so um, i think we definitely need to fix our fundamentals um, it's going to be a very difficult very difficult time for citizens um, tourism is likely to you know who would have thought that ukraine and russia would go into war right like nobody would have maybe i don't know maybe if you're like a geopolitical expert you would have known but like in general people would never have expected it and then um, you know sri lanka tourism was heavily promoting to the ukraine and russian clients and then you know those two countries happen to be the two countries that go into a war and then obviously that's going to affect us but obviously these outside factors we don't have any control over but we need to fix our internal fundamental issues because 
if we are not economically stable it's going to be very difficult to um carry on with business as usual and to keep building on that um so yeah i think fixing our fundamentals is going to be is is going to be our salvation thank you rahan uh i think now we'll move to the last of you know, the last uh, we've been talking about the whole issue and the in the way and the kind of back it at down experience uh on note just want to ask what this what are your suggestions what needs to what do the policy makers of this country need to do uh to really correct the situation to drive the economy towards uh, a recovery just as as entrepreneurs and you rehana as a analyst uh what what are your recommendations uh also saying that i think uh, the elephant in the room has been the imf everyone's talking about imf as also being uh the salvation uh so so just tell us what you guys think awesome you know i don't short term fix there has to be a long term policy for this whole thing you know the supply chains cannot break down in a country it break down yes you can have power cuts for you know but not at this at not at this you know and you know there was people forced all this they saw it happening you know they knew there was a gas problem they knew this thing so you know you, you know you never know in a month time there won't be gas again so there is no you need political governments option to come up with a common platform and say hey this is the road map for 10 years no matter you can go out of parliament i can be in the opposition no but if you want to attract foreign investors to have a clear cut policy boi chairman can change but you need to clear confidence to people to come and park their money and in these things you know regimes can change, but there is a print and at least in your blue that is how to get this track it's a small net don't forget can bounce back. but we need the politics out the window he didn't say guys going okay no short term um i think um we should start with minimum wages i think there needs to be an increase in minimum wages uh inflation should reflect on the wages we pay our staff as well as the way it reflects on our prices you know uh, if not how are they going to survive you know and then we go back to this whole hr issue which hapo was talking about uh, i think we should start with uh, minimum wages i think that should go up and um, there's no easy solution to this you know and i think um, the decision makers over here they need to look beyond loans and currency swaps how can like what are the creative ways to bring in investments you know i mean we put out the port city like let's think of different ways to bring in money there you know and uh, i think those are the things we need to be looking at in, as solutions yeah yeah uh vimanga you said people are saying that imf is our salvation right so once again we you know we want to place our salvation in something else but i imf is not the salvation it's it's the bridge to salvation you know it's what's going to help us get uh, to where we need to be so um, you know as harpo said we are a very resilient country and you know but we need to be smart about how we change our economy to you know so that we never end up in a situation like this again and we need to address the fundamental you know the issues the you know how did we get here and we need to resolve those i think we've been talking about how we got here for so long and now that you know we are going to the imf it's time to you know really dig deep and understand and you know really commit to the change that's required to take us to uh, you know to the tra- you know to the place that you know we want to be as i said it's you know imf is the bridge 
so we need to make sure that we by the time we get to the other side of the bridge we are not going to turn back so thank you uh just want to know i think we are we are close to been going on for an hour so uh probably it's time to end the discussion but do you do you guys have any concluding thoughts for our audience uh saying before saying that also i'm you know honored uh by and also inspired by the resilience uh shown by our business community uh by our medium and small enterprises uh and us business leaders uh so definitely applause to that uh but do you guys have any concluding thoughts for our, for our audience yeah my let's all stay positive we have to be likewise um stay positive i mean that's how that's the only way we're going to get through this you know yeah you. uh you know i think i have a tendency to be a negative nancy but yeah i completely agree i think we uh you know we have to be positive because you know we we are we are hit rock bottom so there's nowhere to go beyond, but upward so we have to keep you know keep hoping and keep uh, believing and keep working towards uh you know bringing sri lanka to a level that it was not at before thank you rehan babu uh thank, thank you apine uh so ladies and gentlemen it's been a fantastic conversation i am extremely thankful for all of you uh for joining uh this adver chat session uh I, uh and we've discussed a lot and the message has been to be hopeful uh i would also just like to add that you know the old uh milton friedman quote uh which is governments never never learn only people learn so i think this crisis is also an excellent opportunity for us to learn uh what message uh learn the importance and learn from these experiences and probably not repeat the mistakes we've made uh saying that uh i am extremely thankful and delighted uh for for all of you for taking part uh just a uh you know a follow up message from the communication team uh please follow us on instagram twitter youtube linkedin facebook uh we have a lot of uh analysis outputs coming up over the course of uh the next few months uh also you can support us at uh, www.supportadvocata.org uh ladies and gentlemen it has been a fantastic conversation uh it's delighted and 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 hope you have a good evening thank you thank you thank you vimanga thank you all bye hey take care